I am Ashley Marie Tate, the 87th Miss University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Today, I am honored to be a part of the National Libraries Week program here at our very own John Brown Watson Memorial Library. As I reflect of all of the librarians and libraries that contribute to my success today, my heart begins to smile. Oftentimes, the tools and resources that have always been available to us are forgotten. However, on today, I bring you all warm greetings and appreciation to not only our great library, but to librarians and library, and library workers across the world. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Lemoya Burks, library instructor for Texarkana College, and I will be uh, presenting the history of National Library Week. National Library Week began in 1958 as a natural, national observance sponsored by the American Library Association and libraries across the country each April. It is a time to celebrate the contributions of our nation's libraries and librarians and to promote library use and support. All types of libraries, public, school, academic, and special participate. In the mid-1950s, research showed that Americans were spending less on books and more on radios, television, and musical instruments. Concerned that Americans were reading less, the ALA and the American Book Publishers formed a nonprofit citizens organization <coughs> called the National Book Committee in 1954. The committee's goals were ambitious. They ranged from encouraging people to read in their increasing leisure time to improving incomes and wealth and developing strong and happy family life. In 1957, the committee developed a plan for National Library Week based on the idea that once people were motivated to read, they would support and use libraries. With the cooperation of ALA and with the help from the Advertising Council, the first National Library Week was observed in 1958 with the theme, Wake Up and Read. National Library Week was observed again in 1958, and the ALA Council voted to continue the annual celebration. When the National Book Committee disbanded in 1974, ALA assumed full sponsorship. National Library Week is observed each year in April, generally the second full week. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Carolyn Ashcraft. I'm the director of the State Library and often referred to as the State Librarian. It's good to be back at UAPB and here in the library. Thank you for the invitation to be a part of your celebration of National Library Week. I had an opportunity to quickly meet uh, today's guest speaker, and I can tell you that we are in for a great time and a great presentation just in the short few minutes that I had to, to chat with Julius. Julius Jefferson, as you'll see in your program, uh, information about him is a fourth generation Washingtonian and there probably aren't too many people who can say that. His roots run deep in the information science field. His father is a retired archivist. His career spanned 37 years at the National Archives and Record Administration, which we refer to as NARA. And his mother is a retired technical specialist at the American Library Association Washington office. So with that kind of background, he had to, of course, have an interest in libraries. His BA in history is from Howard University, and his MLS, his Master's in Library Science, is from the University of Maryland. He comes to us today from the Library of Congress, where he leads the Knowledge Services section in the Foreign Affairs, Defense, and Trade Division of the Congressional Research Service. He supervises librarians who provide public policy research assistance exclusively to the members of Congress, to congressional committees and to staff. Before joining the Library of Congress, Julius worked at his alma mater, Howard University. And I can tell you, just in our brief time, we were talking politics, <laughs> library politics, which is an even more finite uh, area of discussion. With the American Library Association, we're facing several changes this year in leadership, and they're looking for a new executive director of the association as well as Emily Shetikoff, who is the main key individual at the ALA Washington office, 
is retiring. So he and other members of the American Library Association have a big task this year in helping to select the leadership of the future for the American Library Association. I'm very excited to hear what he has to share with us today. And uh, I know that you will join me in extending a great Arkansas welcome to Julius Jefferson. Thank you very much, Ms. Ashcroft. I appreciate that. And thank you all for having me here. Um, I want to extend a special thank you to the staff here at John Brown Watson Memorial Library, um, especially Mr. Fontenet. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you to Ms. McGee for calling me up and while I was traveling in my car saying, you think you can come by to Arkansas and talk to us? I said, really? Arkansas, that wasn't sort of on my radar. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, why not, why not? So thank you. Uh, thank you to Ms. Fisher. Uh, I, I had contact with her uh, and helped me, helping me get here. And just to all of the staff and all the library workers here, uh, I really appreciate the hospitality you showed me. Uh, as it was noted, this is my first time in the great state of Arkansas. So I didn't know a whole bunch about Arkansas. I know about Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> We have a Walmart in my neighborhood. It's kind of taken over D.C. Uh -huh. um, of course, the Little Rock Nine. Right? Um, and recently, I just found out, are there, are there any uh, Dallas Cowboy fans in here? Oh. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. <laughs> I, I didn't know this, but I just found out that Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones both went to the University of Arkansas, played football there, and they were part of the only national championship that the uh, University of Arkansas has had. So, so I was I was surprised. I'm like, oh wow, I didn't know that. I, I just thought that they just happened to come together to make all this money and, and have this football dynasty. So um, that was interesting for me. But again, um, you know, it's a pleasure to be here. When I was, I, I learned some things when I was uh, flying. So I just came from Chicago. I was in Chicago for a week. So I've been home in a whole week. So I am ready to go home. And um, I was at the American Library Association's executive board meetings. We have exec executive board meetings in the spring, so I was there uh, for meetings. So I left D.C. a week ago, it was 75 degrees. It was beautiful. I got to Chicago, it was 40 degrees, it rained two days, I lost two umbrellas, and I was, wasn't too happy. And then the day I left to come here, uh, it, it, Chicago was about 75 degrees. I got here, it was beautiful, it was sunny. I love it. Um, I learned something about the airport. So O'Hare Airport actually has more than the B and C terminal. So I left out of the, the F terminal, which is really, really, really far, far, far away. <laughs> I was on a really small plane. Um, I haven't been on a small plane like that in a long time. It was a little bumpy, I was a little nervous. But as I was flying in, I, I got to see how beautiful the state of Arkansas was from the plane. So it's a very, very beautiful state. So I was, I was pleased by that. So beautiful state with beautiful folks. So um, the University of Arkansas at Pablo, I think, is very progressive. Very progressive. You celebrate National Library. I mean, how progressive is that? And I, I kind of took a look around some of the eight other HBCUs to see what they do. And I didn't see a lot of HBCUs celebrating National Library. Week. So I said, wow. And you also celebrate uh, Band Books Week as well. So very progressive here. And I applaud you for that. Um, I know that some of the speakers you've had in the past, and you've had great speakers in the past, they talk about things very specific in, in the world of librarianship. Um, so today, um, I'm not going to talk about, in, at least uh, in, my, in my brief moments in my presentation, I'm not going to talk about the Library of Congress and what I do with the Library of Congress. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, I'm not going to talk about technology or access and all those other issues in librarianship. I'm not going to necessarily talk about that. But I will be talking about um, advocacy. And I will be talking about broadly the library, uh, the American Library Association's advocacy program, Libraries Transform. Mm -hmm. And I will be talking about that in context of how it helps us in the community. So I'll be talking about that. I will be talking about experts in the library specifically those experts that have shaped my life and maybe your life as well. I will be talking about um, those experts that I call culture keepers. I'll be mentioning some names. Hey, Mr. Fontenet mentioned one earlier today um, from his experiences that he uh, has, has come across. And I will be talking about 
equity, diversity, and inclusion in librarianship in our libraries, because I think that's very important and a part of the whole idea of, of, of advocacy. So it was great to hear a little bit about the history, so thank you very much. Um, and so when you think about the idea of National uh, Library Week, you have to understand that the State of the Library Report comes out on this day. So the State of the Library came out, and a part of the State of the Library Report um, they include the top 10 challenged books. So I thought I would just share with you a little bit about the top 10 challenged books. Um, I'm not gonna read all of them, and it just came out today. I heard about it over the weekend while I was at the meeting, and it just, I said, I went this morning to, to pull it up, and I said, Can, it, it, where are they? It said, oh, it's not up there, it'll be up in a few minutes. So someone emailed it to me, and it is online now. So we see trends um, in the top 10 challenged books and and when you think about books that are challenged one of the trends is that the books that are being challenged now in our libraries are also being banned as well so they're being challenged and they're being banned so um the big trend really focuses around sexuality books about sexuality so folks still uh don't want the the, the whole conversation about sex uh to be discussed or read in american libraries and then gender you know, same-sex couples. That's the other really big trend. And these books are actually being uh, not just challenged, but they're actually being banned. So here are a couple of a uh, couple of names. And if, are there are any are there any public libraries in here? Public libraries. Okay. Be public libraries. Raise your hand. Public libraries. <laughs> they're like I'm a public librarian. <laughs> um, academic librarians. I know we have a lot of academic librarians. Of course, we have the state library. Right. <laughs> and, and special librarians, I'm a federal librarian. So a lot of the public librarians kind of will see this uh, in, in some of the challenges. So we have uh, this one summer, there's an illustrated children's book. Uh, or, uh, adult, uh, no, this young summer is a, is a young adult graphic novel. And it's been challenged for uh, the LGBT characters and drug use and profanity. And it was considered sexually explicit with mature themes. So that's uh, one. We have two boys kissing. You can tell what that's about, right? Two boys kissing. Um, but this was also included in the National Book Award long list. It's designated as a Stonewall Honor Book. But it's been challenged, and actually that one has been banned as well. Um, we have uh, on the list Eleanor and Park. One of the one of seven New York Times notable children's books. Uh, it's a young adult novel, and it was challenged for offensive language. Um, and the last one I'm going to mention is a book by someone who I think we all know. Uh, his name is well, I won't tell you his name, but the title of the book is Little Bill. <laughs> we know the author yeah. of yeah. Little Bill, Bill Cosby, and that made the top ten challenge books. You say why? Well, I think. <laughs> so this is a children's book. This children's book series was challenged because of the criminal sexual allegations of the author. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really fascinating. I said, well, wow. So he's been, there are allegations, but he hasn't been convicted of any crime. Mm -hmm. but, but they're going to challenge and actually ban the books, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I'm sure um, if you have kids, you probably purchased the books and read them to your kid. Um, but because of his own personal history, they are challenging him these books. So I just thought I'd share that with you um, before I, I go in to talk a little bit about Library Transform. I thought that was just kind of fascinating, um, just to see the trends that we're seeing. And when we talk about the type of advocacy um, that we all should be doing, uh, a part of that is certainly to defend the freedom to read. And that's a really big thing for me, defending the freedom to read. So Libraries Transform. Let's talk about that. So the Libraries Transform campaign, it kicked off uh, in 2015, kicked off right in DC. And it was a multi-year advocacy campaign. And if we need advocacy now for libraries, I think now is, is the perfect time. Because I think now um, we are seeing uh, with the um, our new executive president, our, and the executive branch, the president, and, and we see in, um, Congress, that there certainly are rollbacks to funding because the way the funding is shifting is going more in one direction toward defense. And we've seen this before. 
And of course, it's, it's affecting the arts. So the president put out his skinny budget uh, not too long ago, and in the skinny budget, he wanted to uh, get rid of the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which provides a significant amount of grants to libraries and museums around the country. He wanted to get rid of NEA and NEH. Um, of course, that has to go through Congress, and Congress has to decide. So we certainly need to understand how uh, it's important for us to have a voice, for librarians to have a voice to save funding, right? Um, so the, the, the campaign began in 2015, and in, in 2015, we didn't know where we would be today, but luckily, it, it started uh, in the initial years, libraries transformed, and it focused on transforming the lives, so it focused on the library, the, the, what the library does for the people uh, who use the library, right? And we all have different users. Um, the public library has specific users. Of course, the academic libraries have specific users. I work at a very large library that's kind of a bit of everything. We have, um, and with, with the new Library of Congress, it's more uh, becoming more public focused, but certainly it's a research one institution as well. And so uh, the campaign focused on what does the library do? What services does the library offer uh, folks who come into that library? And, and, the, and the president of the American Library Association last year um, was Sarah Feldman, who is a director of a public library. So she certainly focused on you know, what they do in public libraries. That's what we kind of saw. Um, she's the director of the Cuyahoga County Public Library in uh, Cleveland. So she, she looked at what, are, what, what kind of services do we provide? Um, you see public libraries that certainly provide services for folks who need employment, job employment. You see uh, the public library providing services for immigrants. Um, you see an array of services that they provide in the public library, and that's what the library does. Um, she also uh, talked about, of course, um, just the library being a place for lifelong learning. So no matter where you are in your life, that you can come into the public library and you can begin to develop new interests, right? Because um, li the library should be a place where we don't, don't ban uh, information. We don't ban books, and you have an opportunity to explore whatever you want to explore in your life. Um, and this is a smart investment of our dollars, and that's where the old advocacy comes in. It's a smart investment to have libraries in our community. So we did a lot with the first year of just talking about the effect of libraries themselves. So then we moved to the second year of the campaign. We're still in the second year. This is the, this campaign is under the um, president of the American Library Association, Julie Todaro. And Julie Todaro is a academic librarian. She's a scholar and academic librarian. So she wanted to focus more on the fact that uh, people don't know what librarians do. Like, like, what do you do? <laughs> you you read books all day, right? <laughs> you shell books all day, right? You shell books. Cause there are a lot of books are digital, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of lot of resources are digital. So so but like what do you? And so she wanted to focus on, well, not only does the, the library provide services, but the services are provided by people. Right? It's the people. And these people are experts. So she focused on experts in the library. I mean, you library workers are experts. And just as a side, I forgot to mention that uh, today starts uh, National Library Week, and tomorrow, of course, is National Library Workers Day. So I mean, we certainly should be, you know, thinking about library workers, uh, not just librarians, not just people that have library degrees, but people who work in library to provide services. And they, they're all over the place, right? It's just not one type of folks. We have folks in IT, and of course, I love the IT folks, believe me. <laughs> IT folks can make a break you, so you always have to be nice to IT folks, right? <laughs> bear with them, bear with them. But folks who, who uh, help keep our libraries clean, they work in libraries, they help keep our libraries clean, they help keep, keep our libraries going every day, and we forget about that. So, but it's, we're talking about experts in the library, what librarians do, and of course, people ask me, and, and this, is, this is just when I was coming out here, I saw a friend on the, um, on the airplane, he happened to be going to Chicago while I was going to Chicago, and um, a well-educated man, you know, very good job. Uh, we belong to an organization together where he's a leader, and um, he had come to the library for a program, he saw me there, and I said, yeah, I work down the hall here. 
And so he said, yeah, yeah, I know you said you worked it, but what do you do? <laughs> I'm like, well, I mean, my job is not necessarily a typical library job, but librarians do a whole bunch of things. So, I, and I kind of gave him a list of things that librarians do, but, but the other things that experts in the library do is, is provide the keys to critical thinking, which is so, so important now, right? I mean, the idea that um, we have this thing called fake news. Anybody heard of fake news? <laughs> so you do realize that there's no such thing as fake news. Right. <laughs> there are lies <laughs> and there are truths. <laughs> but don't believe the fact that there's, there's, there's nothing right. fake about a lie, right? right. <laughs> but, but librarians provide access to the truth. That's what librarians do. Um, I, I like to think that that's what I do uh, for, for Congress provide the truth non, in, in a nonpartisan fashion. So it doesn't really matter which way the truth falls, I'm gonna give you the truth no matter what, right? And so, you know, providing critical thinking in public libraries uh, for, for, for youth, because of course there's an assault on funding for school librarians, and when they don't have school librarians, then the kids have to go to the public library. Of course, there's another relationship because when the children aren't uh, when they don't get the type of education about how to access information at that age, they come to you here at the University of Arkansas in Pine Bluff, and they don't know how to find information to write a research paper, right? So that makes your job even more difficult. So that's how critical it is to develop critical thinking at an early age, um, have, it, have it happen at the public library and the schools, and so when they come to college, they're really ready to learn and do research. Um, but the experts, again, provide access which allows for folks to have uh, this idea of intellectual freedom, right? That I can, I can go ahead and search and learn about anything that I want to learn about. I mean, these are specific skills. Uh, a core, core concept of librarianship is intellectual freedom. And intellectual freedom is also a part of one of the strategic directions of the American Library Association being information policy, advocacy, um, now um, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which is a, a new strategy that we develop, and leadership and professional development. So those are the four strategic directions of the American Library Association. And so librarians do more than just sit at the desk. I mean, I don't, you know, the whole idea that the librarian has a, a bond and, you know, it tells you to, <laughs> that's the stereotype, right? Yeah, that's right. the stereotype, but that's not. And, and as I'll talk about uh, in a little while, librarians come in all shapes and sizes, all different colors, from all different backgrounds, because we serve diverse communities, right? So when I think about you know, these experts in a library, I have to think about those experts that had an impact on my life. And there, there are a number, a number of them, um, and I'll talk broadly about a couple. Uh, a few, actually. So the first one I'll talk about, and we, I call these individuals culture keepers. And, and you may be familiar with some of these names. Uh, I, I have my brother out there that may be familiar with Murray. You, you, you heard of Murray? You know who that Murray is? Okay. This is, this is that Murray's father, Daniel Alexander Payne Murray. So you know the Murray I'm talking about? Okay, all right. And so uh, I start with um, one of the individuals that has an impact on my life and in my career, Daniel Alexander Payne Mary, who uh, was the second person of African descent to be hired at the Library of Congress back in 1871. He was hired by Ainsworth Rand Spofford, the Librarian of Congress at the time. The first person to be hired was a guy by the name of John F. N. Wilkerson, who started as a, um, started actually dusting the books. When people ask me what I do at the Library of Congress, I actually tell them I dust the books. <laughs> <laughs> but that gentleman, and then he became the assistant of all librarian. But Daniel Alexander Payne Murray um, became the assistant to Ainsworth Rand Spotford. Um, he was born in, in Baltimore in 1852. He came to D.C. very young and um, worked, went into catering along with his brothers and then got found himself uh, at the Library of Congress. And a few years after being there, he became a bibliographer. He was tasked by Herbert Putnam, who became the Librarian of Congress, to amass this collection of information about African Americans to be shared at the 1900 Paris Exposition. And that's what he did, and he did a good job. 
and he spent 52 years at the Library of Congress uh, amassing, um, amassing information about African Americans. And that collection is now known as the Daniel Alexander Payne Murray Collection, and he had an impact on black scholarship, black research for generations of individuals. So he is what I would call a culture keeper, and a person that has an in impact on my life and many of the lives of the individuals in this room. And I'm not just saying individuals who are African descent or are black, but Americans, because he had an impact on American history. So, and it's interesting that, uh, that Daniel Alexander Payne Murray actually in his tenure early on became a supervisor. So this would have been in the late 1870s, he became a supervisor. He lasted about a, a year as a supervisor because uh, the individuals who he supervised did not want him supervising them. So he actually um, took a, a cut in pay from what he was getting before, right? So he actually lost money, went back to his old job, and still kept that job for 52 years uh, and had a, had a great career and a great legacy. So the other person is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Has anybody ever visited the Schomburg Library in New York City? Yes? Okay. So that library is named after Arthur Schomburg, who was, is, is really the reason why I, be, one of the reasons why I became a librarian, because I used to, when I lived in New York, I used to visit the Schomburg Library quite a bit, um, and just was fascinated by all the information that he collected uh, by and about people of African descent. It had a significant impact on me and many other researchers. Um, Schomburg went on to donate his large uh, collection of information uh, to the um, New York Public Library System, which became a research library. It, it was the 135th branch of the New York Public Library, uh, the Harlem branch, and is now the Schomburg Collection for research. So he had a significant impact. Um, Schomburg um, was born in 1874 in Puerto Rico. His mother was of African descent, his father was white, but he loved people of color and did so until he passed away. So the other person who's very significant um, in, in sort of being an expert in the library is Dorothy Porter Wesley. And Dorothy Porter Wesley was another giant in the field about uh, collecting information about people of African descent. Um, she, she was born in about 1905 in Warrington, Virginia. Um, she attended Howard University and went on to Columbia University to get a master's degree in library science and then began a career in 1930 at Howard University where she took over the collections of um, Joe or his brother, I think it was no, Arthur Spengarn's collection and um, Jesse Moreland combined that collection to the Moreland Spengarn collection and created her own classification system for this that still exists to this very day, believe it or not. It was like a combination of M for Moreland and Dewey Decimal. She never in her lifetime wanted to switch over to the LC classification system and they, and they never changed it. She retired in 1973. Still, to this day, it, I mean, if she were to come back alive, she, it, the place kind of looks like it did <laughs> when she left. <laughs> she passed in 1995. But, you know, she was considered to be, in her lifetime, the dean of, of black librarianship, and again, influenced and, and assisted many, many scholars. Um, she was married to a great uh, artist and art historian, James Porter, who was also a professor <coughs> at Howard. And after he passed, she uh, married the great historian and a brother of my brother in the audience, Charles H. Wesley. So, so she is another individual whose whose shoulders I stand upon. And all these individuals are, are are individuals whose shoulders I stand upon, and many of you in this room. So, <coughs> when we talk about advocacy, we have to kind of talk about the idea of <coughs> activism. And there was probably no a better activist librarian in the 20th century uh, and, and on to the 21st century than E.J. Josie. E.J. Yeah. E. Josie is what I call you know, the consummate activist librarian. Because truthfully, <coughs> if you become a librarian, 
generally speaking, you, you're not going to be a millionaire, right? So you have to have some other reasons why you go into the profession. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But for EJ, he combined his activism and librarianship. And he wrote significantly about it, writing a book in 1970 called The Black Library in America, where he just kind of surveyed what black folks were. But he was also very active in the American Library Association, where at one point in his life, in the 50s, and so, which is not that long ago, where uh, African Americans couldn't be a part of state associations. And EJ was instrumental in, in, in sort of, you know, uh, integrating um, the chapters in the states. And um, we still pay homage to him uh, a couple of years ago. A few years ago, um, I had the privilege of editing a publication with two other colleagues uh, about the 21st century black librarian on on Dr. Josie's shoulders, trying to say, where are we now? You know, where are we? This was 2012. Where are we in 2012? We found out that he hadn't really come that far from 1970. Mm -hmm. So um, the next person is Clara Stanton Jones, another activist librarian. And, and, and Clara Stanton Jones um, was the first library director of a, of a public library in a major city. And that was the Detroit Public Library. She also was the first African American to be president of the American Library Association in 1976. So the library, the American Library Association was founded in 1876. Its first person of color to lead it happened in 1976. So that was a couple of years, took a while. Um, E.J. Josie also became president in 1984. And so, uh, and, and I will say this about Clara Stanton Jones, um, right around uh, the 70s, you, ha you had uh, many other librarians who became activists. They started something called the Social Responsibilities Roundtable in the American Library Association. And they looked at, you know, some of the, not just, not just the services, but how all this relates to our lives, how it impacts our lives, right? So, so they were looking at, you know, libraries transform way back in the 70s. So you know, things that are new are not really new, right? <coughs> And um, she was a, a, a strong advocate against um, racism in the American Library Association and in libraries back in the 70s. Clara Stanton Jones, a, a, a very large figure in the profession. And finally, I, I would have to mention um, the new boss at where I work, um, Dr. Carla Hayden, as being one who now, uh, of course, she's the 14th librarian of Congress. She's the first female uh, librarian, of, librarian of Congress and the first librarian of Congress of color. And she has the responsibility to provide access to the American people. So we're talking about making sure that all of your stories are preserved and are told. That's her job. That's, I mean, technically that's her job. Of course, it's much more complicated than that, but that's what she's in charge of. She's in charge of the largest collection of material in the world that we know, <coughs> right? So um, these are individuals who I call culture keepers. They've all had an impact on my life. They've all had an impact on the communities that we serve. So, and I said I would talk a little bit about just recruitment, but so I, I mentioned that equity, diversity, and inclusion is a new strategic direction of the American Library Association. But what does that really mean? So we, we kind of think of we kind of think of it broadly and that you know in terms of you know what do the numbers say? So the numbers say that, that out of um, I think it's one hundred and twenty two thousand credential what they call credential librarians that have masters of library science 12% of them are people of color. So not black, but people of color. So I'm talking about Native American, Asian, Hispanic, people of color make 12%. So that means 88% are white. So we do know that the populations that we serve don't necessarily look like that. That's what we know. And so it's important that we have people that are representative uh, working in libraries, serving these very specific populations. And so I always think about what type of environment do we have in, in libraries? Do, are we inclusive in our libraries? Um, and so the idea of equity, diversity, inclusion doesn't just look at race, but it looks at 
sexual orientation, it looks at age. And are we really inclusive when we think about sexual orientation, think about age? And I would say we may not be, and we really need to take a, a, a stronger look at our libraries and, and are we providing the environment that will allow folks to come in, our patrons and people who work in the library. And I always like to focus on the next generation. What's the next generation? What are we doing to prepare the next generation of librarians and library workers? Are we doing enough? And I, I would say I don't think so. But it's, it's sort of hard to say, yeah, you know, don't be a doctor, don't be a lawyer, be a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, by the way, you're gonna have to go to library school too. <laughs> so after you finish your undergraduate degree, then you're gonna have to go to library school. And you really may not make a lot of money. <laughs> you could though, you could make a lot of money, but you may not make a lot of money, it depends. So we have to think about our profession is one of service. And do you want to serve people? And if you want to serve people, then this, this is a really good profession for you. I think it's, it's a great profession because there are so many possibilities to be in this profession. And so many types of people you can serve. Um, I had said that, you know, a lot of kids when they're young, they want to be um, athletes, right? They want to go to the NFL. You know? When I was a kid, I loved Earl Campbell. Uh, and I wanted to be like Earl Campbell and play for the Houston Oilers or something, right? Of course, Earl Campbell is a pretty big guy, and pretty fast, and I wasn't big or fast. <laughs> and, um, but but I, I thought about it and I said, but do you know that the NFL has a library? You know that? So I could have still been in the NFL. <laughs> I just wouldn't have been on the field. And thank goodness, <laughs> those guys are pretty big and fast, and I, I got broken up. But, but the truth of the matter is that there's still a place, right? So not everyone's gonna become a doctor, but there are medical librarians. Not everyone's gonna be a lawyer, but they're all law librarians, right? I mean, there's a place for you, I think. And I, I think that we don't do enough to share the possibilities to our youth that it's a viable career option. I mean, and you get to serve people. I mean, part of librarians, and I know that you know, the stereotype is libraries say be quiet, but the librarian today is not telling you to be quiet. The library today is engaging you. It's very engaging and trying to help you maneuver the vast amount of information coming at you to select the right information that you need to solve your information needs, right? And so I believe that there's a place for folks in this profession, a very needed place. And part of what the equity, diversity, and inclusion looks at is how we can bring more people into the profession, but, but foster an environment that's inclusive. That's really important. Because part of it, and I'll just say this, that where I work, um, I'm the only black male librarian at the Congressional Research Service. And I'm like, that's crazy. I'm the only black male. There was one, he retired uh, about 10 years ago and that left me and we haven't brought one back in yet. And I've tried, I've tried. Um, but I mean, and I, and I said that I won't be successful as a librarian until I am able to bring someone in. And I may have to start younger. I may have to start you know, with someone in middle school and start grooming them. <laughs> but but this, is, this, is, this is, you know, where we are. You have to start grooming folks at an early age to think about, you know, career paths, right? So by the time you get someone uh, in college that, that, that has a mass college debt, they're looking for the job that pays the most, right? They've, I've been in school five years, and, and they don't think, oh, yeah, I got to go another two years to get a master's degree. That's going to be more debt. Um, but we have to start having people think about the career options earlier in their career. So I think that this is something that I believe is very important to me, and it should be important to everyone in the room. Because whether you're a librarian or a library user, I think it's important that we have individuals that help us to understand you know, our, our cultural backgrounds and our cultural differences. I think that's very important. So I always like to say that there is a library behind whatever you want to do in life. Um, for me, there were, and I went to Howard University, um, I had a cadre of mothers in the library that supported me that I would not 
And it took me a while to graduate because I wasn't as focused as I am now. But I would have not have graduated if it were not for the ladies specifically uh, at Founders Library. Individuals that got me focused and, and then led me to this career path very specifically. So I talked about folks broadly that affected our communities, but there were individuals that sort of led me on the career path specifically, and they were in at HBCU. So I absolutely support recruiting at historically black colleges and universities because there are a lot of career options for folks when by the time they do get in the profession and sometimes they don't want to go to a HBCU. And I said, well, no, HBCUs need really great librarians as well. I mean, the students that go there need folks that are going to focus on their information needs and move them to the next level of academic research. So I am thrilled and ecstatic to meet all of you here, the visitors and the folks who work here at the John Brown Watson Memorial Library, <clears throat> and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Um, well, this is the question and answer session, but the first person we're going to ask you, uh, Mr. Jefferson, is with the experience that and knowledge that you have a library and ship, what components do you think that a 21st century library should have? <clears throat> One of the things that I tell people coming into profession is that I have a good understanding of project management because so much of what we do in libraries is not traditional library work. It's sort of like project management. Um, librarians are managing projects, are moving things along, and I think that to have an idea of administration and project management, I think, is a, a good skill to have uh, in librarianship. Thank you for being here, excuse me. My name's David Hutter, I'm a reporter at the local newspaper, the Pine Bluff Commercial. And I'm just endlessly fascinated that libraries in the United States in this year, 2017, are still banning books. So to, to what extent, where are these libraries and how can they still be banning books in this day and age, sir? <laughs> Believe it or not, they're all over the country. So there's not a, um, there's not a specific place like in the South, they ban books. I mean, they do, uh, but they ban them in the North. They ban them all, all over the country. It's, you have to think about, um, it's not, the, you know, banning books is not, you know, like one big homogeneous situation, right? It's communities, it's small communities all over the country. Um, and depending on where you live and depending on what the content type is, uh, they, their books are being banned. Now, now, for a book to be banned, there's usually a challenge process. So, and, um, what we're, what we're seeing is that you have certain legis state legislatures um, moving in a direction to sort of ban curriculums, which is sort of banning books, like in Arizona, which they had a big situation several years ago. Um, but So you're seeing uh, books being banned on the county level, the, uh, a, a district level, um, and schools, and then you'll see it sporadically throughout the country at the, at the public libraries as well. Many folks in Arkansas will also know that during this current legislative session, which is hopefully wrapping up when they come back on May the whatever day, that they tried to ban any works by Howard Zinn. And we got some national recognition for this effort. <laughs> Fortunately, the legislator who proposed that bill, the bill got stalled in committee thanks to advocacy on the behalf of librarians and historians and folks all across the state but there is always the anticipation that if they try it once they'll try it again mm -hmm. Howard Zinn one of his predominant works is the history of the US people I believe is the name of it so it's providing kind of an alternative uh, explanation of a lot of historical events that happened mm -hmm. and banned mostly in school libraries because of school curriculums who included that so people could have those critical thinking skills to, to help determine what's true and factual information but thankfully in arkansas this effort uh, was defeated <laughs> thank you i i guess i was thinking the same way that the reporter was thinking my question was you mentioned that some of the purposes of the library are to provide opportunities for lifelong learning and access to truth and I wondered if you consider banning books a contradiction or a conflict of interest in that regard. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, the idea of intellectual freedom is a major strategic direction 
and a part of the American Library Association. So it's one of the things that librarians should believe in, providing access, not necessarily taking a side either way, but providing access so folks can make their own lines. And, and if, you know, if someone thinks that this book is not a good book, then they don't have to read it. But don't don't tell everybody else. And put a disclaimer on the section where they are. Anything well, like even and that's called labeling. And even then, even then, librarians feel some librarians feel that even labeling is sort of sort of triggering. It's sort of a trigger. So let folks decide what they want to read, and don't tell me what I, I mean. You know, don't tell me what I can read. I want to read whatever I want to read, and not have someone tell me I can't read it. But yeah, that's Thank a contradiction. You. I appreciate everything that you have uh, been saying. Um, I'm wanting to know what are some essential books for young African Americans or people of color to uh, really gain information and knowledge about who they really are and where they come from? Um, because in this society, it's so easy to, uh, with social media, get caught up in, this is what you need to look like. This is what society says you are, what you should do. Well, what are some essential books um, that young people of color can read to kind of give them a, a sense of self-awareness or uh, self-identity or self-actualization about who they really are and, what they, and where they come from? Um, That's a good question. Um, I have to send you out my bibliography. Let's find out. I just want to recognize Dr. Blakely. She and her husband published a list some years ago. And we have the list there, not only include black, but also uh, a list of cultures, other cultures. Mm -hmm. right? So we have a list uh, about the black. <laughs> and uh, I, I would say, oh, you, do you want to add to that? And, and I would say, um, just off the top of my head and the way I think, anything that Frederick Douglass ever wrote, yes. anything that he ever wrote, everything that he ever wrote, read it right absolutely read it because i think essentially you have to you have to start looking at um slave narratives you know you have to start thinking about the experiences of african americans in this country um of course um i recommend anything that du bois ever wrote starting with the suppression suppression of the african slave trade um dr du bois chronicled the whole experience. He talked. He also wrote about the Reconstruction Era. So you can go look at what Dr. Du Bois wrote about the Reconstruction Era. I mean, these are essential readings, and there are a number of them. And Dr. Fontenot mentioned in that bibliography, I'm sure that you can go in. But I would say, I would start with, with books like that. Okay. Hi, my name is Tisha Arnold. I'm the Public Information Officer here. Thank you for being Hi. here. Um, I was intrigued by a presentation I think you did, I don't know if it was this year or last year, about the shortage of black males um, in librarianship. But my question was, when you were leading to that, when you were talking about cultivating um, another, some other people of color, um, in Arkansas, there are a lot of institutions, especially competing institutions, that will come here and pick up students and take them to you know, their campuses. So I don't know if there's a program like that for librarianship, um, for you know, whatever your segment that you're trying to target pick one or two or three students and bring them to, you know, wherever you want them to, um, just a thought. No, 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 that's a good thought. I, um, what you're talking about is um, a presentation I did, that was like almost 10 years ago. Okay. And <laughs> I, I Googled it, sorry. <laughs> and I'm, I'm about to uh, put out a publication next year, which will be 10 years, to kind of take a look at what I talked about in 2008 and what's happening in 2018. So I, I kind of waited for this long gap to get the data and then compare it. I kind of probably know what the answer is going to be. But, 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 but then it's not just um, about what the answer is. It's about solutions, right? And yet what you're talking about is, is, is more of a solution. And I think that's certainly something to consider. I, I, you know, one of the other things when you talk about doing recruiting is folks have to be committed to going a certain place, right? So some folks say, well, I don't want to go to that particular state or I don't want to go there. And I, I tell people that, yeah, you think you want to come to the Library of Congress, but you get there and you wish you weren't there either. So the grass is not greener, right? It's, I look at things as that, where can you get an opportunity to provide service to individuals? In other words, where you need it, right? Because there was a time 
um, in Dorothy Porter's day, where in 1930, what, she wasn't gonna go anywhere but an HBCU. That was it for her. I mean, you know, it wasn't gonna happen. And she ended up spending, you know, significant part of her life developing something there, a legacy that, you know, everyone can benefit from. So, but that's a good point. I'll, I'll certainly think about that. And this is actually kind of ties in with what Ms. Arnold was asking. It was a question asked about what opportunities for internships and uh, fellowships or any volunteer programs that are offered that you may have there at Libraries of Congress. That's a good question. So, um, one of the things that we have at the Library of Congress, we do have um, diversity internship programs. So we have one called a Student Diversity Internship Program. Um, it's it's kind of broad. This year, I um, and and the thing about internship programs, so you can it can be a diversity internship internship program, but the law says that anybody can apply. So anybody can still apply to a diversity internship program. I try to get the message out. We bring in, we brought in undergraduate students, we brought in graduate students as well um, for librarianship and for other professions in, in, at the at Library of Congress, of course. It's not just librarians, it's at the Congressional Research Service. They're about, I think now, uh, I think 70 librarians, uh, 200 uh, policy, public policy analysts, and then there's infrastructure, probably human resources, IT, um, the editors, that type of thing. So student diversity internship programs, we have something called the Haiku program. It's the Hispanic, uh, I forgot the acronym, but it, it brings in books of Hispanic descent. Um, we also have something called Junior Fellows. Junior Fellows apply, and all this is, is online. The application process is all online. And that's it, battery is low. So all of these programs are online, but the Junior Fellows program is always a great opportunity to be selected um, to be a Junior Fellow because you work on broader initiatives and projects at the Library of Congress, and then you get to present them at the end of the year, whether it's during the school year or over the summer. So we have Junior Fellows, uh, SDIP, Student Diversity Internship Programs. We have the um, Haku program. And of course, we have folks that just volunteer and, and do unpaid internships. And I know that's a little bit more difficult for folks around the country to travel all the way to, to Washington, D.C. and not have any pay. Um, the other programs that does have pay, but there are volunteer opportunities as well. So, so just to let you know, you know, I uh, got a chance to talk to Mr. Fontenet over the phone, got a chance to spend some time with him today. And of course, you know, our path, paths have crossed. Um, he actually was at, it was called the Legislative Research, was it Legislative, Legislative Research, area. Research Center back in his day. It's called the Congressional Research Service today. Um, he was there as a part of um, what they used to have as an internship program to bring people in the Library of Congress. He, well, I think, was part of one of the first classes of, of LC interns. Um, I won't say what year, but it was a few years ago. A few years ago, and, and still knows I think at least one person that was a part of his class. Uh, so, so he was at the Library of Congress and and and, and almost had a chance to go to Howard University, but he but he turned it down and ended up here for forty years. Aren't you glad you have him? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I thought the grass was greener too at the Library of Congress. But <laughs> <laughs> it, it really was not. <laughs> I tell you, there, 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 there are always pros and cons. Right. The pros and cons of where you work. And I come to a place like this, and I, I feel more at home than I do, you know, at home where I work. And so, you know, how much is that worth to you, right? You have to, you have to evaluate. Is it? Is it worth a lot to you? If it is, then you're probably in the right place. If it's not, then you know there are other places that you can go. But you know there there are going to be things that you have to give and take when you go other places. You have to keep that in mind, and certainly when you think about a uh, career option and and you know the type of um, profession that you want to have, career you want to have. We want to thank you for uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, he travels around and works with other librarians. We have a special thanks for. Dr. Uh, Chandler, who noted him. Oh, thanks for Dr. Chandler. We have, we thought we had four, but we have three new librarians. We couldn't have done that without his effort and Dr. Chandler's effort. Yes, yes. Um, thank you. Let's give him a little
my name is Georgette Wiley. I'm the Associate Library Director, and I'm here for a special presentation. According to the UAPB Faculty Staff Handbook, the goal of UAPB's Library Committee, which is composed of about 15 faculty members, students, and staff, is to advise the librarian, Mr. Fontenet, on services and policies for the university and the Pine Bluff community. The committee interprets library service concepts to potential users, supports local, state, and national library services, reviews assessment reports on library development, and facilitates long-range planning to assure excellence in library services. The UAPB Library Committee would like to welcome its newest member, the Pine Bluff Jefferson County Public Library Director, Ms. Laura Whitehead. <laughs> Ms. Whitehead joins the Pine Bluff community after having been a library supervisor in Artesia, New Mexico. She has also held previous positions at St. Luke's College, Lawton Bronson Community Schools, and South Sioux City Public Library. She received her master's from the University of Mississippi, I'm sorry, Missouri Columbia in Information Science and Learning Technologies with an emphasis in library science. Ms. Whitehead has skills in information literacy, collection development, library management, electronic resources, circulation, integrated library systems, grant writing, ebooks, research, and community outreach, just to name a few. So I am sure that she will be an invaluable member of the UAPB library community. She is also an avid angler who already feels right at home in Pine Bluff, and she welcomes any secret fishing spots you may be willing to share with her. She's mother to a 19-year-old daughter and a newlywed. So Mr. Fontenet, would you please come forward? And Ms. Laura Whitehead, would you please come forward? And would all UAPB students, staff, faculty, and community members on the count of three, please say welcome to our newest UAPB Library Committee member. One, two, three, welcome. welcome. inviting me here and for this I'm very excited to be on the committee and to work with this <coughs> library so both libraries can work together and enhance our services uh, to each other and so far I, I love Pine Bluff, I love Arkansas and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Afternoon ma'am. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here to give out our awards for our speakers and our guests here today. Our first award goes to Mr. Jefferson, Certificate of Appreciation. This certificate is awarded to Julius Jefferson, Jr. in recognition of outstanding contributions as a 2017 National Library Week keynote speaker. Thank you very much. Next certificate of appreciation to Mrs. Carolyn Ashcraft. And finally, certificate is awarded to Lamonia Burks. Lamonia. 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 